Welcome to another IDWorks Learning Lab. Um, I felt a bit rough when I woke up this morning, but at least I didn't wake up dead. Um, this headgear that I'm wearing at the moment is for two reasons. Um, first of all, um, somebody recently nominated me for a sainthood. So I'm just trying on this little bit of headgear to see what it's like. I also feel that I'm pretty well qualified already because when I was on a, an Irish holiday just recently I shook hands with a guy that has actually shaken hands with Mother Teresa so hey look that's my entry ticket anyway enough about my personal life um, let's get on with today's session now today is all going to be about a health check on my machine it's probably about eight months since I fitted the copper mirrors and to be honest I really haven't touched the machine since I fitted my tube and fitted those mirrors. So today is going to be a bit of a revelation in several different ways. I've got some stunning news for you. Well, stunning, maybe disappointing news. We'll have to wait and see. Okay, well, the very first thing we're going to use on uh, this health check, and it will probably be the last thing as well, is something that I like to consider as the anal thermometer of the laser world. It's this little device here which uh, somebody whose name is on there, Gene Dusselman, um, has invented and it's a very useful tool. Um, you'll be able to find the DXF for this somewhere on the RD Works Lab website. So what we do is underneath we stick a piece of masking tape like that and then there are two ends to this the obvious end to hold is this big end but to start with I recommend you use this little spoon handle on the end here and turn it this way round because what we're going to do we're going to drive the head to the back corner and we're going to set the power it doesn't really matter what the power is set to but to be honest, it's probably better that you set it fairly low, maybe 15%. That's pulse power, so I'm going to get 15% when I pulse it. Now, what we've done, we've put the head right to the far back corner, and we've got five dots on here, which we need to remember which way round we're using it. So that's going to be the back left-hand corner. We're going to pop that on the nozzle, and we're going to just make sure your fingers are not in the way. We're just going to burn a little hole in it. Then we're going to run to the other corner and get the same there. And then we're going to come roughly to the middle of the machine and do the same thing again. So we're now going to do the front left hand corner of the machine. You don't use your left hand to do this with because you could easily get your arm in this beam path across here. This is going to be a bit, um, a bit of a contortion because you need to have your finger on the pulse button. Pop the pulse through there. Now this final corner here is particularly dangerous because you've got this beam right across the front here. So make sure that you lean right over the machine and keep your arm out of the way of the beam to do this very last corner. Okay, let's take a quick look at these results. Now, the good news is, it doesn't look as though there's anything seriously wrong with the alignment of the axes because the beam is pretty central, not perfect, but pretty central across all parts of the machine. As we can see with this bottom left and this bottom right, there's a slight off-center in the opposite direction, but I certainly wouldn't be worried about this for general use. This is why I'm calling this a laser, a laser thermometer because it basically gives you a very quick health check of what your machine is doing. Okay, well you've seen me enough times using my little doohickey power meter to measure this. Um, I've already just cooled it down in there and I'm going to turn the meter on and it says 18.9. I'm going to start the program off. I'm on a 14 second program. Well, you don't have to panic for 10 seconds. I'll put this in the way and it says 18.7 so that's our starting point 
and it went up to 56.6 okay so 56.6 minus 18.7 equals 37.9 times 2 equals 75.8 six months ago when I measured this machine 80% was delivering 76 watts Today, six months later, that same calculation, 75.8 watts. So it looks as though this tube is still in very good condition. Now, the reason why I'm actually going to carry out this whole test again, and I want to do a new calibration chart, is because I found out a very interesting piece of information just recently. When you buy a tube, which supposedly has 10,000 hours of life in it that's not 10,000 hours of beam on time that's shelf life that's 10,000 hours from the day in which they put the gas into it now in real terms I don't think it means exactly 10,000 hours and your tube will stop working. I think there is a statistical calculation that they do using the famous bell curve and probably they'll find that 10,000 hours is down here somewhere and most of you if you had a 10,000 hour tube would get up to maybe 20 or even 25,000 hours but the best that they will tell you is that it's probably a 10,000 hour tube down at this end of its performance range. Statistically you might be unlucky and get a 10,000 hour tube but the chances are that most of you will get a 20,000 hour tube. But that's an interesting piece of information because it does mean to say that the myth that I'd heard that tubes have a shelf life is true but the shelf life and the working life are exactly the same. So the word of warning there is don't go out and buy a spare tube until you need it. Because the moment you buy your tube, your life is starting to tick away. You want a tube which has got the most recent manufacturing date on it that you can possibly get. Tubes like I had to start with, which are 50 millimeter diameter tubes, they're only 800 millimeters long they're supposed to be 50 watts, they're only 40 watts, they haven't got very much gas inside and this life on tubes like that is only said to be 1500 to 2000 hours. So let's assume that when we buy one of these machines we've got the cheapest cruddiest tube you could possibly get and the maximum life that it's going to have is around about 2000 hours. So let's just take 2,000 hours and we divide that by 24 hours a day and that's only 83 days. Let's just divide that by typical month which is 30.5 days. It means we're only going to get two and a half to three months life out of that tube. When you buy an eBay machine, first of all remember that it's been built with this, what I've now seem to have proven reject tubes from a good manufacturer life unknown but let's just assume it's 2000 hours then it does mean to say that first of all it's got to be built and sit in the factory it then goes on a slow boat from China to wherever that could well be a month getting to where the warehouse is uh, and then how long does it sit on eBay before you buy it the point I'm making there is by the time you buy it you've probably even used up all the tube life that's there. Now this shelf life which turns out to be tube life is all because of the way in which the gas is sealed in here. Even though this is a good quality tube we've got epoxy resin around the end here which is sealing the mirrors onto the end of the tube. Now those seals are not completely impervious and over a period of time you will get a certain amount of leakage from the outside world into the tube itself because the the gases in that tube 
are there as a partial vacuum. So there is a want for the external air to want to creep into the tube. And in doing so, it will mess up, mess up the pressures inside the tube and also the gas mix. There are two things that are going to destroy your tube. One is time and the other is overdriving it with too much current. Now the reason why I'm testing this tube at this moment in time is because this is claimed by Mactron to be a 4,000 hour life tube. I've had this in the machine for over six months now. So what I'm going to do now, every month, I'm going to do a calibration chart on this tube to see just what happens to it as it reaches the end of its life. If we come back to this picture, I may be talking absolute rubbish because it may well be at the beginning of its life. It may well be that it's got, you know, it's not even halfway through its life yet. Maybe it will run for 10,000 hours. So there's no need for you to follow me, but I'm going to now rerun my calibration tests and redraw the graph and see just what it is today. Well, here's the revised calibration chart. As you can see, the green line is the new line. It's a little bit low there, but there's nothing terrible. And once it gets up towards the top here, it's virtually exactly the same. So it's certainly still delivering as a 70 watt tube and there is no real drop off in this power characteristic. I would expect as this gets towards the end of its life that this green line will start tailing off a little bit over here and we shall get a different characteristic. But at the moment there's no sign of that and I'm only guessing as to what might happen. So over the next few months we'll just see what happens to this tube and then we'll find out what the real story is. Okay we're now going to test the mirrors and see how the mirrors have degraded over the past eight months. Something that may be of interest to you is what on earth am I doing here? I'm just going to give you a little demonstration. You can see how far the table is below the nozzle. It's what probably best part of eight or nine inches. But despite the fact that the beam is coming out to quite a large diameter by the time it gets this far down and is very, very defocused, what I'd like you to do is just have a quick look at what happens when I run this power test. Now I'm going to put the power up to 65%. Okay, now this is the spiral test that I'd normally use to run my little doohickey power test with. Now if I happen to take the doohickey out of the way and the power comes all the way through to the table you will see what happens now you can see that even though we are this far away you've still got scorching on this wood just in case I remove the doohickey at any point in time, then the water will absorb the energy in a harmless way. Now, once the beam starts, I'll just put my hand up here and I can feel just the merest hint of some warmth. There might be one, two, maybe maximum 5% of the energy being reflected off that water surface but 95% or more of the energy is being absorbed into the water so that's a nice safe way to fire your laser at your table okay well I've just measured I've just set the power to the maximum that I sensibly want to run this machine at which is 65% which is the rating for the tube which is 70 watts and as you can see we've got a reading of 69.4 watts which is pretty good. So that's straight out of the tube. So what I'm now going to do is to check the power after mirror one. So I'm not going to bore you with the details but what I'm going to do is I'm going to check the power as it comes out of mirror one. I'm going to check the power as it comes out of mirror two. I'm going to take the lens off and check the power as it comes out of mirror three and then I'm going to put the lens back on I'm going to test somewhere down here what power is coming out of the lens itself. Well, here are the results that we finished up with. Not very good, I'm afraid. We started off with uh, 69 watts, nearly 70 watts. After mirror one, we'd lost 2.3%, which is more than I'd expected, but typical of some mirrors. Um, then we lost 5% at the next mirror. 
and 6% at the next mirror but my goodness me what happened with that lens? Well the answer is you can probably see in the middle of that lens there that dark spot when I turn it over I find at the back of the lens which is the side that was facing down to the work has got a lot of pitting on it and also it's got this mark on the work side which is rather strange because that's the side where we've got air flowing into it and should be clean so I'm a bit puzzled as to why that is but undoubtedly that's the reason why we've lost so much power so what I did was to replace that one and a half inch lens with a two inch lens and I repeated the same test okay I got significantly better results but they're still absolutely rubbish at 24% there's no way lenses lose 24% so my first thing to check to be honest as whether or not we're actually firing out of the nozzle itself or whether there's something else happened now that I've changed the lens okay well bear in mind I'm now using a two inch lens which means I've got a much bigger beam coming out of the nozzle and what's actually happening is as you can see here the beam looks as though it must be striking the side of the nozzle and that's probably why I'm losing power so I've adjusted the beam in steps here and here and eventually I've got the beam back to a central position so what I'm now going to do is check the power loss again well now that I've centered up the beam um, we've improved the output from 45 watts say 46 watts to 56 watts so we've gained 10 watts just by centering the beam up now that's a phenomenal amount of increase just for being a little bit more accurate with your beam centering even so I'm still getting 4.8 watts of loss which is an equivalent of 8% loss through the lens and I would expect maybe as much as about a 2% loss but we'll work with this for the moment because I've got some more lenses on order so in the meantime what we're going to have to do is to check what's happening at each one of these mirrors to see if there's any way that we can improve the mirrors now it may well be that there is just a film of oxide on the surface as several people predicted there might be I mean these are not hideous losses but they're substantially more than I would expect uh, a standard um, molybdenum mirror you'd expect about a 2% loss on each one of them well this is a lot more than that so copper mirrors are not going to be the fix if I'm going to have to work on them every maybe month say first we're going to drive the head right to this front right hand corner as far away from the laser tube as we can possibly get it so both the beam paths are as long as they can be and this is where we now use our masking tape and we put our masking tape and I put the masking tape on this way so that I can see my strike lines that line across there should be the center of the burn mark that I'm going to produce so I'm going to just use a pulse I've only got 15% remember so I may have to hit it several times which is what I want to do to produce a scorch mark rather than a burn so there we go now that looks very very good in terms of beam centering so the problem was not as we had, as we saw with the one and a half inch lens the the beam is actually very good in relation to these two axes so the mirrors are well set up so I'm going to turn the laser off and what I'm going to do I'm going to put a piece of masking tape across the switch to remind me not to turn the laser back on until I've removed my little red pointer right well here we are with our red spot um, pointing to the burn mark now and because that's fixed when I take mirrors two and one out I can very quickly put them back into the right position by just quickly lining them up so let's take mirror number two out which is the one 
that had the most amount of error on it. Well here we are a couple of minutes later and I've now got the mirror off and we'll just take a look at the mirror and if we catch it in the light right you'll see clearly how it's tarnished on the surface. If you catch it right look you can see that it is still very reflective and we have to assume that that tarnish is having an effect on it even though I was expecting it not to have much effect. Okay now that's literally 30 seconds worth of buffing that's all just on a little soft rag, flat surface, Meguiar's polish and hopefully we may well have restored that mirror. Okay so we've put the mirror back on and to be honest it's gone back in nearly the right place so we've got to make just the merest amount of adjustment to it. We'll take it up and across just a shade and this one here will take it up and just a shade and there we go we've probably got that beam back on centre now as simple as that and now we'll take a look at the rear mirror mirror number one now mirror number one was not losing a huge amount of power let's just see if we can catch it in the light right there's a couple of you might just see that look there's a couple of marks just on the surface there roughly where my finger is so we'll just quickly go and give that a buff up and here we are again just 30 seconds later we've got a pristine mirror again okay that mirror is now locked in we'll go and pop that back in place okay well there's the rear mirror back in place and as you can see it's not quite lined up So from the back of the machine here I should be able to just see through the cover and tweak one of the screws to bring it onto centre and then tweak the other screw to lift it up. We'll take the other one back just to shave because it's slightly to the right. And down just a shade. And there we go. <clears throat> well, I'm now going to take the masking tape off of mirror three and we should see the beam appear on the table on that piece of wood down there and there it is. Okay it's a big beam but then again it's well and truly out of focus this particular two inch lens which is about three quarters of an inch away from from the end of the nozzle I've brought the table up into focus so there's a little red spot right in the middle of that cross there and what that's going to enable me to do is to remove this mirror number three well mirror number three is easy because I can take the mirror off without even removing the mirror plate there is a little bit of a halo on the side there furthest away from over this side here where my finger is you might be able to just see that so I'm just going to give that a polish up as well it's slightly brown very slightly brown not quite pure copper color so that one again has a really nice shiny finish on it it's been restored to new with about 30 seconds worth of work so we put the mirror back in we have to do very little to get that back onto center that looks to be about right Okay, now that I've removed the red dot sensor, I can remove my piece of safety tape from the laser switch and I can pop that back onto there. Now if we turn the laser on, we should be able to do a quick pulse and see whether or not we need to tweak the mirrors at all. Well, I think you'll see that that mark was quite substantially bigger and on centre. 
So I think the first thing we'll do is rerun the power tests. On the second set of results, we've got a slightly higher wattage coming out of the tube, which is not a problem. I mean, it's only about one and a half watts bigger, but it doesn't really matter because we took all the results at the same time, so we've got comparative um, results. So let's look after mirror one, we had a 2.3% loss originally. Now we've got that down to 0.6, which is where I would expect it to be for copper, something better than 99% efficient. So that is superb, that one's back into, back into where I expect it to be. Now the second one, 5.3 loss, we've now got a 5.6 loss. And the third mirror, 5.9, we've now got 6. So in fact the losses at mirror 2 and 3 have seemed to have gone up even though I've cleaned the mirrors. Now what about the lens? The 2 inch lens was giving me a 24% loss. And now, after we've done all this work, and I haven't touched the lens, we're down to a 13.4% loss. So there's all sorts of little puzzles and problems here because how can the lens performance change when I haven't even touched it? So my point is it must be something to do with what's happening at mirrors 1, 2 and 3 for it to be affecting the lens. So there must be something wrong with the beam itself. Now, at the moment, we started off with a 40%, with nearly a 50% loss when we started off at this machine. We're now down to 23%, 24%. So, it's still a very significant loss, and we can't leave the machine like this, because, to be honest, it's rubbish. The only thing that I can say is, without that little bit of kit, or something like that, I wouldn't have a chance of sorting this problem out. Now I do believe the problem is one of my own making, i.e. the copper mirrors. But what I've got to establish is, if I can get 99.4% efficiency out of a copper mirror, then why can't I get 99.4, 99.4 out of the other two mirrors? Now I have got an idea what the problem is, but I think this is going to run into another session. So um, I'll catch you up in part two.